unexpectedly. Carol had to go home for the day. And so I'm here and Amanda is here. And there are a few of us here in person. We're not on the South Lawn, but Amanda is um, ready to do her presentation from Maria's room. And we are very pleased to have both her and Jenny from Darville's Books here uh, so that Amanda can sign some copies of her books. If anyone wants to come in person, we'll be here until at least 4 p.m. Um, I don't have any other announcements, so I am going to turn it over to Amanda Swinimer. Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to say, sorry, I, I didn't get to meet Carol. I, from what I hear, she put a lot of work into this event and I'm really happy to be here from my home on Vancouver Island. And uh, yeah, COVID strikes again. So instead of being on the beautiful uh, grounds of the Orcas Library, um, we're doing it from inside. So we're rolling with the punches. And uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about one of my favorite things on the planet today, which is seaweed. And um, Darville's books as well has uh, my book, The Science and Spirit of Seaweed, um, both at their store and in the library today for um, signing afterwards for those who wish. So I'm going to share my screen and just talk to you a little bit about um, just what seaweed is, um, sort of what kelp is, which is one of my passions within the seaweed world. I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship between how seaweed nourishes and uh, protects both the ocean ecosystem and our bodies and how those two things are related. And then I'll talk about some of our local species here in the Pacific Northwest. So those of us who are lucky enough to call the Pacific Northwest our home, um, we have the most abundant diversity of seaweeds on the planet here with an estimated 650 species. Uh, we have the most species of kelp of anywhere on the world. There's 30 uh, described species to date. And uh, we have huge healthy intact areas of intertidal seaweeds and abundant healthy kelp forests. So it's not incredibly simple to define what seaweed actually is, um, but just give you a, a basic um, summary here. And seaweeds belong to a larger group of organisms called algae. And algae are an incredibly large and diverse group of organisms. And they range from microscopic single celled, essentially like a photosynthesizing bacteria type organism all the way up to um, the giant kelp and the bull kelp that can grow in excess of 100 feet. Uh, what unifies them as a group is that they are all photosynthetic. Um, but aside from that, they're incredibly taxonomically diverse. And they can live in almost every environment on Earth, from the deep sea vents to the fur of sloths <laughs> to um, intertidal zones with highly fluctuating temperatures, um, drying out and becoming wet again. Uh, so all kinds of, of areas that algae can inhabit. When we talk about seaweed, <clears throat> seaweeds are formally called macroalgae and seaweeds can be further divided into three main groups. We have the red seaweeds and the green seaweeds, which are in the plant kingdom. And then we have the brown seaweeds, which are in kingdom chromista. Seaweeds are, even though the red seaweeds and the green seaweeds are in the plant kingdom, um, 
that's actually relatively new. They, they used to be in the same kingdom with the brown seaweed. So they are very different from plants in a lot of ways. Um, they're a lot more simple. They're much more ancient than land plants. They don't have roots or flowers or seeds and they don't have transport systems. They don't like uh, plants do, but they just absorb the nutrients directly from the water that they're in. Kelp. So really fast, simple definition of kelp is that they are large brown seaweeds. So all kelp belong to the brown seaweed group. And they're, like I said, they're the largest seaweeds on the planet. And the official um, designation of a seaweed to be a kelp is that, that it's in the order laminarials. But for most people who don't, you know, aren't a seaweed scientist, what's really important is that kelp share a lot of really important healing properties and they're incredibly important um, to ecosystems. They grow kelp forest ecosystems, uh, grow on about 25% of the world's coastlines. Um, they're currently, they have to grow in temperate waters and cold water. They are currently in a state of decline at about 2% per year. And um, the effects of climate change, in particular, marine, the increased incidence of marine heat waves is pointed out as the most significant driver of their decline. So now I'm going to get into just a bit of how um, seaweed is such an incredibly important um, part of, of the planet in terms of its health and how that translates to how it's healing to humans as well. So seaweed is an amazing purifier. And in the ocean, it transforms toxins. Uh, particularly, it will absorb certain heavy metals and then it will uh, transform the molecule that those metals are stored into into usually biologically inert um, substances that will just pass, pass through your body. And the reason they do this is because the things that are toxic, some of the things that are toxic to humans are also toxic to seaweeds. So that's how they deal with that is they um, change the, mole the molecule that, that that toxin is stored in from an inorganic form to an organic form. It makes it a lot less reactive in the body. When she talks about body, she's talking about the body and the seaweed. Well, maybe our body. No, I, sorry, I, no, I'm talking about the human body <laughs> as well. Um, so, well, that's what seaweed does in the ocean. So now I'll be talking about the human body here. So in our bodies, um, one of the, the thing, ways that seaweed helps purify toxins um, in humans is that it has something in it called sodium alginate. And sodium alginate binds to some of the worst environmental toxins known. It binds to certain heavy metals, PCBs, certain radioactive isotopes, um, dioxins, and it forms an insoluble salt in our gut. So it's not going to be dissolved in the bloodstream. And then it's safely excreted through the stool. So seaweed, um, and here I'm talking about the whole group of algae, which includes seaweed, is incredible nourisher. In, it's the primary producer of the largest ecosystem on earth, the ocean, and kelp forest ecosystems in particular are one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. Seaweeds are also incredi incredibly nourishing in our bodies. They are the most concentrated food source of minerals on the planet. They're rich, most edible kinds are rich in vitamins A, B, C, D, E, and K. 
Um, they also have an abundance of protein. Most of them, the highest in protein is nori with uh, up to about 50% protein. They have essential fatty acids, and that's usually in a really ideal one-to-one -one ratio, which is um, optimal for human health. And when people think about getting their omega-3s and some of these other rare essential fatty acids, you think, um, you know, no, cold water, oily fish. Well, algae is the original source of those essential fatty acids in the fish because it's at the bottom of the food chain making its way up. Um, they're also a rich source of fiber and, and some of these particular types of fiber uh, give seaweed some of their really, really potent and unique uh, healing properties. And also a source of prebiotics. So seaweeds actually contain things that nourish um, the, the friendly bacteria in our gut that we now know um, our gut flora is responsible for the big part of our immune system, healthy brain function, healthy digestion, so many things that are important for human health. So because of all these um, nutrients that seaweeds contain, they really help nourish most of the major systems, if not all of the major systems in our bodies. And algae seaweed, also an amazing protector. Uh, you could argue that algae may be the most important uh, group of organisms on the planet in terms of, of the health of the planet. Um, algae produces an estimated 50 to 80% of our oxygen. It absorbs an estimated one third of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Algae, some species of algae also release dimethyl sulfide when they die, which mixes with oxygen in the air to form um, the sulfides that form the nucleus of cloud formation. And this is a process that's really critical to regulating global climate. And in addition, our macroalgae, so our seaweeds, um, help to lower the acidity of the water that they grow in, which is an increasing problem um, that's caused by climate change. Seaweeds also are an amazing protector in our bodies. So um, a couple of the uh, molecules I have here, the compounds I have here, fucoidin and fucoxanthin, uh, I go into a lot of details about these particular compounds in my book. Um, there's been well over a thousand peer reviewed science studies on fucoidin and a, a large number on fucoxanthin as well. And scientists have studied um, the anti cancer effects using different mechanisms on different types of cancers um, and also amazing protective qualities and cleansing qualities for the cardiovascular system, anti-inflammatory properties, a whole host of antiviral and antibacterial activities. So a lot of really promising um, research that traditional medicinal use of seaweeds has used seaweeds in these ways for uh, a very long time. Uh, so science is sort of catching up to um, these traditional uses and, and sure enough, verifying um, what people have been, traditional people have, been, have known for quite some time. Seaweeds are also um, amazingly resilient. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, they not only grow in some of the most extreme environments, uh, in the world, but they thrive in these environments, um, particularly, you know, areas of, of the intertidal zone, you have seaweeds can be exposed to wildly different temperatures within a tidal cycle. They can be go through freezing and thawing. They can go through, um, yeah, all kinds of um, being exposed to different airborne bacteria and then marine bacteria. So they're just amazingly resilient and 
as you know, living on an island, they, they really thrive in the intertidal zone. And because they've been able to adapt to these extreme living conditions, they have, um, can, they contain a whole medley of these unique compounds that are not found anywhere else in nature. Some of these compounds have amazing potential in helping, uh, in helping to support human health. One of the major things um, when seaweeds are living in an environment that's exposed to very different temperatures is that they have they can prevent protein misfolding and protein misfolding is um, indicated in uh, neurological disorders like Alzheimer's and Huntington's and Parkington's. And there have been studies showing seaweeds ability to prevent protein misfolding in human cells. Um, this work so far has been in isolated human cells in the lab, so not on whole people yet, but um, really exciting research going on with the protein misfolding. They've also, again, they're exposed to both marine bacteria and airborne bacteria, marine and airborne viruses, fungi. So they have a whole um, range of, of unique uh, antipathogenic compounds that uh, can help protect humans as well. And a lot of the incredible, amazing medicinal properties of seaweeds, I've been learning along the way. But what first got me interested in harvesting seaweed was the fact that you can eat it. <laughs> so that sort of definitely what drew me in was being able to go into the ocean and wild harvest um, food. And um, when I talk about harvesting seaweed, of course, always the very first thing that I want to uh, really get through is um, the sustain to be sustainable and ethical about harvesting. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, here in the Pacific Northwest, we we have been blessed with the most abundant seaweed diversity on the planet. So it's really, really important that we share the responsibility of that gift um, in order to protect it. And there's uh, a lot of things to consider if you're going to be harvesting your own seaweed. Um, so you really want to get um, proper education and make sure that you are doing it in a sustainable, ethical, responsible way. So bull kelp is probably the most iconic and easily recognizable seaweed here in the Pacific Northwest. It has that big, thick uh, tube-like part on it that's called a stipe. And like most edible seaweeds, bull kelp is very rich in vitamins and macro minerals, as well as rare trace minerals, protein, fiber, essential fatty acids. And uh, some of those unique compounds that I was talking about that have a lot of um, amazing potential to support human health, the fucoidin, the fucoxanthin, and the sodium alginate. Bull kelp also has some incredible healing properties. <clears throat> and again, um, relating to some of these compounds that I talked about earlier. So a lot of uh, potential in preventing chronic illnesses, uh, supporting thyroid with its rich iodine content. Bull kelp has specific antiviral activity against herpes and it's uh, neuroprotective and helps to actually safely remove via the sodium alginate some of the neurotoxic metals that can accumulate in the brain over time.
Bull kelp is uh, very fun to harvest if you don't use a boat like I don't <laughs> uh, because it's subtitle. So I go out um, a few hundred meters offshore and into the kelp forest. And then you can just trim some of the blades from each you know, individual bull kelp to go around. And there's, like I said before, when you're harvesting um, with all seaweeds, there's a place where you can cut the seaweed where it will regenerate. And there's a place where you can cut the seaweed where it will not regenerate. So knowing the parts of the seaweed and the um, species that you want to harvest and where the new growth happens is really critical to ensuring that you're harvesting in a way that is pruning the seaweed so that it will continue to grow back. Bull kelp is one of the fastest growing organisms on the planet. So if you harvest it in the proper way, you can actually go back four weeks later and it will have grown sometimes, you know, 10, 12 feet in that amount of time again. So you want to harvest by pruning. Um, bull kelp is the second largest seaweed in the world. Um, and remarkably, it's an annual seaweed. So it can grow in excess of 100 feet. And it's doing that in about six months time, growing sometimes uh, a foot a day on the sunny days of summer. Bull kelp is a lovely edible seaweed. Um, it's very salty. I find it the saltiest tasting of all the seaweeds and a really strong umami. So it really leaves that tingle and sensation on your tongue. So I find it's really good as a seasoning ground up. Um, you can grind it up and use it as a seasoning instead of salt, or you can use it as the base in sauces like a pesto. Uh, really lovely seaweed to, to um, use in cooking for sure. Winged kelp is another really amazing edible seaweed, sometimes called wild wakame because it is closely related to the Japanese wakame. And again, it's rich in uh, very similar uh, nutritional properties as the bull kelp. It's rich in vitamins, minerals, protein, fiber, essential fatty acids. And again, these compounds that have really amazing uh, support for human health, the fuco fucoidin, fucoxanthin, and sodium alginate. And those three compounds are unique to just the brown seaweeds. And again, uh, very similar uh, healing qualities as the bull kelp with the um, fucoidin and fucoxanthin offering protection from certain cancers and chronic illnesses, thyroid support, et cetera. Um, the winged kelp is harvested quite different from the bull kelp. The winged kelp is a low intertidal species and it does not float. So the only time you can get uh, the winged kelp harvest, winged kelp is at a very, very low tide. And because it is a low intertidal species, it's not used to being exposed to air very often. So it really needs to be harvested in the spring because once it gets more and more exposed to the air on really hot sunny days as summer progresses. Um, it really gets sort of scorched by the sun and starts to get munched up by herbivores and really isn't in as good of condition at that point. And again, like I mentioned before, having an education before you harvest a particular species. So the winged kelp has a separate reproductive structure that grows close to the bottom of it near the what's called the holdfast. And those need to be left intact so it can reproduce. And again, a good portion of the blade needs to be left intact to ensure that the seaweed that you're harvesting from doesn't die, but just continues to grow um, because you're harvesting by this pruning method.
So the winged kelp, again, sometimes called wild wakame, it's just an absolutely lovely edible seaweed. It has a mild, very slightly sweet um, flavor to it. It just has this wonderful texture that takes on the consistency of noodles when you use it in soup. It adds a briny, minerally uh, uh, flavor to soup broths. It can be soaked and wrapped around fish. Uh, it is really a, a fantastic edible seaweed. And when I started my business um, selling hand harvested wild edible seaweeds, uh, the winged kelp was the only one the chefs wanted for quite a number of years um, until I could entice them with some of the other seaweeds. Um, so we also have um, dulse here. It's a different species than the East Coast dulse, um, but it's in the same genus, so it's quite closely related. And again, from a nutritional standpoint, you'll see with all the edible seaweeds, they're just packed with vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients. And there's quite a long um, tradition on the East Coast of Canada and the Northeast Coast of the US harvesting dulse and uh, traditionally using it to treat people who had anemia, they would use it, they, they said to build the blood and um, would take it to uh, internally to get rid of internal parasites and worms. Uh, the um, dulse is also a low intertidal to subtidal. It grows annually. And on the East Coast of Canada on Prince Edward Island, um, they used to actually have a time of the year when the dulse harvest was going on where they would close down some of the roads and they'd spread all their harvest on the roads and um, dry it that way. So the whole community would get involved with it. Dulse is one of my favorite seaweeds to eat as a snack. Um, I just eat it right out of the bag. It's very chewy. And again, it has that tingle on your tongue, the umami, and uh, just a really, um, really sort of uh, mineral rich, strong, meaty type of flavor to it. And the last uh, edible seaweed I'll talk about is sea lettuce. So sea lettuce is a green seaweed. It's pretty easy to recognize. It's this bright green um, seaweed. And again, it's uh, packed with vitamins and minerals. And one of its claims to fame is that it contains significant amounts up to about 30% dry weight of dopamine. And sea lettuce, uh, like dulse, was used in, traditionally, um, it was made into a tea and taken to rid the body of parasites. And it was also used to help ward off colds and flus. And uh, traditional use also would be topical to treat burns. So sea lettuce is, um, grows in all areas of the intertidal zone. It's got a lot of folds and frills, so it needs to be well rinsed because there's creatures that like to live there. There's little uh, shellfish, univalve shellfish that will live in there. I've even found little shore crabs in the hiding in the seaweed, um, isopods. So you wanna make sure that you rinse it really well. And if you can, you wanna rinse it in salt water because um, it holds its integrity more than if you expose it to fresh water. And it also has more flavor if it's um, rinsed in clean seawater.
Sea lettuce is a really great edible seaweed as well. It's got a really different flavor um, from either the, the different kelp we talked about or the dulse. It's got more of a pungent flavor, a really light texture. It's, it's only two cells thick, so it sort of just melts in the mouth when you eat it. Um, it has sort of a pungent um, aroma to it when it's dried. And uh, the chefs really like its electric green color. So it often we'll use that as a garnish. All right, I think um, I would love to read a little passage from the book. Um, I'm, it was really important to me when I wrote the book to not just have um, information on seaweed, but to try and share my personal connection and journey with the seaweed, because um, it's just given me so much and I really want to give back. And I feel like when people feel an emotional connection or a sense of wonderment to something, um, that provides a lot of the inspiration required to um, change habits and to act and to protect. Uh, it's, in my opinion, it works better than scary statistics, <laughs> even no matter how scary those statistics might be. So it was really important for me to really share um, some of the more intimate lessons that I learned from seaweed um, in the last 20 years that I've been harvesting. So I'd like to read one of my favorite um, little passages in the book. The bull kelps look like sentinels and soon become so dense that one can only weave between them under their canopy, which is where I love to be. Under the canopy is a whole other world. There are ancient looking rockfish, kelp greenlings and sly faced lingcods hovering against the seaweed covered bottom. Large schools of Pacific sand lance and surf smelt weave as a single entity around the stipes of the bull kelp beneath the thick canopy, which blocks out most of the sunlight from above. I have even seen the odd full grown salmon lurking in the shadows. Kelp crabs abound, traveling along the bull kelp stipe highways. Let's just show you. There's the guy traveling on the bull kelp stipe highways. <laughs> <clears throat> Diving down underneath the canopy, feeling the pressure of held air against my chest, eyes wide in wonder at the teeming variety of life that exists down here, the stresses of my life on shore quickly dissipate. The space they filled inside me gives way to wonder and enchantment. Bull kelp connects surface and depth, encompassing both. It also has a superpower, resilience. In an adaptation to help withstand the force of swell and surge, the stipe can stretch by as much as 30 to 40% of its length. Perhaps there are lessons to be learned from bull kelp. Be flexible enough to withstand life stresses Grow toward the sun at the surface, but always keep your hold fast anchored deep. So I just have a couple more um, slides and then I wanna make sure that there's lots of time for questions um, from, from the audience. So um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about seaweed solutions. And I want to, um, there's, there's been a lot of, of hype in, in the media about seaweed solutions and um, that's partially wonderful, but partially uh, I wanna make sure that I'm, that people are seeing these solutions through a much more nuanced lens than is, than is currently being presented. So um, seaweeds 
store a lot of carbon and kelp forests in particular store a lot of carbon. They are incredibly fast growing. Like I said, um, bull kelp can grow a hundred feet in about six months time. Giant kelp grows even larger than that. Um, it takes a little longer. Giant kelp's a perennial. Um, so regenerating kelp in places where it's been lost um, definitely is can be a potential help for climate change. Um, but the narrative of the bigger, the better and large industrial scale kelp farms everywhere is not really looking at um, is not really looking at it through the, sort of this nuanced lens that we need to. The really important point is that wild seaweed ecosystems are already saving the world from climate change. And wild kelp forest ecosystems do this by having pieces of it break off and sink into the ocean abyss where that carbon is stored for millennia. So when we're talking about um, farming kelp, the science on how much carbon that's actually sequestering is still in its infancy. And it's very, very dependent on where the farm seaweed ends up. So exactly like, like agriculture on land, when we look at aquaculture in the ocean, um, there's a lot of things it, that make a difference to whether or not it's sustainable. There's, it can be done in harmony with the environment or it can be done um, not in harmony with the environment. So important things to think about there. Um, seaweed also uh, is a source for biofuels. And again, it incredibly exciting and a lot of potential there. Um, Microalgae in particular is uh, a really great source for creating biofuels uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't need any clean water and it can actually take contaminated runoff water and purify it and um, in the process. So then you're preventing um, polluted agricultural runoff water from causing eutrophication in the ocean. But again, growing, uh, you know, industrial scale kelp farms for fuel, um, there's a lot more nuance to that than just painting it as, as a solution. It's a lot more complex. So uh, I will think I'll um, end just after this one, but this is something I, I talk about briefly in my book. And I just love this concept of Hoponopono, which is a traditional Hawaiian forgiveness and reconciliation ceremony. And there is a seaweed that's used in this ceremony called Limu Kala. And kala is also the name of forgiveness, is the word for forgiveness in Hawaiian. And this seaweed is, is used in the ceremony um, to bring about purification. And the Ho'oponopono prayer is, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Thank you. I love you. And in the, in the traditional, um, how it was used traditionally was more of gathering of people in conflict and their families and staying in ceremony together until resolution was felt by the whole group. But it's now become um, practiced by people the world over as more of a, a meditation and a, sort of a life uh, viewpoint or a, a way of perceiving life. So it's really sort of expanded from its original um, from its original um, form. So yeah, I hopefully I didn't talk too long. And <laughs> I would love to open it up and um, maybe people can put questions in the chat if that works. I'm kind of just winging it, but um, 
If is uh, if Holly's there, and she, does that sound like an idea for questions? I am, and I am, and there are a couple of questions in chat, and then we've got um, nine people in the room here, and uh, they may have questions. Okay. So the first question: Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. The first question is: You may get to this, but I want to ask about harvesting in such a way to not collect seaweeds that have absorbed toxins, harvest out from the shore aways. How about with winged kelp? That's a really, really great question. So it it's really um, the geographic location is what's critical in terms of making sure that your seaweeds um, doesn't isn't high in toxins. So that's, again, we're pretty lucky, I think, where we, where we live and as opposed to a lot of other areas, but you really want to make sure that you're not harvesting anywhere near uh, sewage outfalls or shipyards where they use the anti-fouling paint, um, Indust industry like, you know, pulp and paper mills or things like that you want to steer clear of. Um, also, if you're harvesting in an area that gets good strong tidal currents, then you have, you know, a, a better flushing in and out of clean water. Um, so seaweeds, because they're so concentrated in, in minerals, um, it is really important to make sure you harvest them from an area that's clean. Um, but having said that, the seaweeds as a food are higher in metals than most other foods, but they're stored in these forms that are um, not reactive in the body. So that's why they can be higher than, than some other foods and still be safe. Uh, but that said, again, just geographic location is the most important um, aspect of making sure that your seaweeds are free from toxins. Okay, thank you. All right, one other question in chat is, are there local Pacific Northwest seaweeds that are toxic to humans? Great question. So um, there are no poisonous seaweeds. So if you make a mistake, um, it's not like mushrooms where you could make a fatal mistake. Um, so there's none that are poisonous, but there are definitely seaweeds um, that you do not want to eat. Um, there's one called acid kelp, which contains sulfuric acid. However, if you ate some by accident, probably you'd feel like a little bit of a mouth burn as if you, you know, drank a mouthful of vinegar or something like that, and maybe some indigestion, nothing that's, that's deadly poisonous, but, um, there are some again, that, that you just want to, don't want to be consuming. Okay, anyone in the room have a question for Amanda? No, they all look very well informed and happy. <laughs> <laughs> Marlia, just a moment. Here on Orcas Island, are there special places that are better to harvest carefully or, um, and does she know of any places on Orcas? Okay, were you able to hear that, Amanda? Yes, I was. So this is my first time to Orcas Island, and I have to say my jaw has been on the ground the whole time. It's absolutely gorgeous. So I don't know any individual areas, but what I could um, could forge a guess is that in protected and sheltered bays, you're going to find your sea lettuce, your dolls. Um, you could find some rockweed, maybe some nori. And then if you're looking for kelps, you're gonna want to go to more exposed, either exposed areas of the island or areas that have really fast tidal currents. And that's where you'll find more of your kelp growing. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Amanda, do you wanna stop screen sharing for just a second so we yeah. can see your face? There she is. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for this presentation. I appreciate you dealing with challenging circumstances <laughs> and um, surprise inside presentations. Uh, we do have books here available for you to sign if anyone wants to purchase a book. 
And I think maybe we'll move the operation outside for that. Would that be okay with you, Jenny? Okay, so we're gonna conclude the Zoom presentation and those of us who are here in person are gonna move outside. So thank you so much, Amanda. Thanks and for having me. We'll see all you Zoomers later. Yay! Thank you.